All right. Good morning, Asbury. How are you doing this morning? Good. All right. My name is Alec, and I'm excited to be here and worship together this morning. This morning, we have the opportunity to worship Jesus together through singing, scripture reading, prayer, and a message from Pastor Lindsay. Now, we want to take a moment to welcome any first-time guests that are worshiping with us today and say that we are very happy that you're here. We love the opportunity to connect with you, and we have a couple of ways we can do that. Option one, you can fill out a connection card, which are available at the welcome desk, which is right when you walk in the main entrance with that little desk over there. Uh, if you grabbed one of those, just fill it out, drop it in the offering plate during offertory. Now, option number two, you can pull out your cell phone and text the word welcome to 281 305-1069. After you text that number, you'll receive a link to a quick connection card. You can fill that out, and that'll give us a way to get in contact with you, follow up, and answer any questions that you might have. Now, we'd also like to follow up with you after service uh, so uh, and share a little bit of information about Asbury. So go ahead and stop by that welcome desk I mentioned earlier on your way out of worship today so we can meet you and give you a small gift as a way of saying thanks for worshiping with us. Once again, my name is Alec. If you want to talk to me, I'll be back there. Now let's get ready to worship. Well, good morning, Asbury. Welcome to worship. What an exciting day to be able to sing praises to the Lord. If you're in the sanctuary, we encourage you to stand with us now as you're willing and able. If you're at home, the words are going to be on the screen for you as well. Let's sing together. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that can We're going to welcome forward Miss Paula and any of the children that are here in the sanctuary that would like to come forward. Good morning, friends. I want to invite all the kids here in the sanctuary up to the front and say hello to any friends worshiping with us at home today. We are glad you are all here. Come on up, friends. Wow, they just keep coming. This is awesome. Come on up, friends. Okay. So I have a story for you this morning. 
When I was in the second grade, I tried out for the spelling bee, right? I studied and studied, and I made it through the class contest, right? And then I moved to the whole school contest. And the word I got was magic. Really easy, right? I thought to myself, oh, I know how to spell this. And I confidently said, I know this word. I'm going to spell it out. M-A-J-I-C. Now, friend, magic does not have a J in it. It does, right? It's a G. So I put a J where the G goes, right? Oh, my goodness. I was devastated. I cried for like two days after that because I really wanted to be in spelling bee, right? It just broke my heart. I was so sad. And I cried for days, and I felt totally defeated. Thank you. I felt totally defeated like I could just couldn't go on. Well, needless to say, I got over that traumatizing event, and I moved on, and God helped me through all that, right? So think about, have you ever had a time in your life where you felt really upset or disappointed? Maybe you missed catching the ball at your baseball game and the team lost. Or maybe you didn't get the part in the school play that you really, really worked hard to, to do. Or maybe a family member gets sick. All of those things can make us feel pretty bad, right? You know, today's scripture is all about that. In the book of Matthew, in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that Jesus was arrested, taken before Pontius Pilate, who was the governor, and was sentenced to die on the cross. The soldiers made fun of Jesus and bullied him and hurt him, and Jesus was put on the cross and he died. Now, most of you have probably heard this story. We talk a lot about it at Easter, right? If that story were to stop there, that Bible story would be really sad and have a hopeless ending that Jesus had lost everything and was defeated. Now, we know how that story ends, right? We know that three days later, Jesus arose from the dead and he was resurrected. He had won, right? Jesus had returned to life and began teaching all of his followers. Now, sometimes we may feel sad, disappointed, and defeated like we have lost, but we always win when we have hope with Jesus in our lives. When we have Jesus in our lives, we are never, never truly defeated. We have God's love that will help us get through whatever bad or challenging thing we may face. God takes care of us and gives us hope and gets special gifts. It may be the gift of a special person to help us out with a hot meal or maybe a ride to school or maybe the gift of a good friend to talk to. Or perhaps when we read the Bible, God helps us understand how much he loves us. We can talk to God through prayer, and he can help us be strong and courageous when we are feeling scared and alone. So when bad things happen in our lives or when we worry, it can kind of feel kind of dark and scary and lonely, but we don't have to stay there, right? Things we can put our hope in the Lord, and we can be strong and courageous and face whatever may come our way. And we can remember this Bible story today and know that Jesus' power gives us hope. Will you guys pray with me now? Okay, so I have a different way to pray today. Remember, we're, we all pray in different ways. So today, I'm going to say a sentence, and then I want you guys to say, you win, after each sentence, Okay. You can pray with your eyes open today if you want. So I'll point to you, but I need for you to say, you win. You guys ready? Dear God, we have hope because we have the promise of eternal life because you win. Jesus, we celebrate because you win. Good job. You're getting the hang of it. Jesus, we have faith because you win. We have victory over sin because you win. And Jesus, we have victory over death because you win. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say, amen. Now, we're going to have wow worship in just a few minutes. Well, that's okay. We're going to have wow worship in just a few minutes, but I want you to go back with your parents first because we're going to have a special, special prayer time, and then we'll go to wow, okay? Good morning, and welcome to worship with Asbury today. I'm Lindsay, the pastor here, and it is wonderful to be able to worship with you, all of you here in the sanctuary, and of course, anyone joining us from home. 
Um, I'm, I'm excited to be in worship today for lots of reasons. I, I love what uh, I believe that God is teaching us through scripture today. This morning at our early service, we had another family join our church, Elwood and Naomi Holmes. If you um, run into them in the hallways, I want you to take an opportunity to welcome them to the church as well. We'll have another family joining our service um, here in a little while at our service here in a few minutes as well. But in addition to all of that, um, we had a family who showed up early for worship today. I got an opportunity to speak with them. And they are Lois and Florence, and they are our brothers and sisters. They currently live in Minnesota and attend a Methodist church there. But they come to us from Nigeria, um, from Nidoro um, in Nigeria, the Wesley Methodist Church. And I just loved getting to speak with them this morning. And I asked them if they would like to help me give the prayer this morning. I thought you might be as encouraged by their faith as I was. And so please help them feel welcome because I've kind of put them on the spot with their permission. And um, please welcome Florence and Lois up this morning. You're welcome. Lewis here is a nuclear medicine tech, and his wife, Florence, is a nurse. Let me share that this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Like our pastor said, we are visiting here for the first time in this church. We are from Minnesota, and we immigrated to the United States from Nigeria in 2021. Two, sorry, sorry, please. 2001, I mean oh. to say. <laughs> sorry about that. 2001. And the main reason why we came to Houston last week was because our daughter was um, about put into bed. So we thank God Almighty for the safe delivery of a baby girl, mother, and baby are all doing great. Mm -hmm. Praise be to God. <laughs> so we are born into the Methodist family in Nigeria. We are of the Wesley Methodist Church in Nigeria. So when we came over to Minnesota, we found another Methodist church there. So automatically, we were all dragged into Hennepin Methodist Church, and we are so happy to be part of the Methodist family. <laughs> Visiting Houston now, I think it was last week, we were dropping our grandkid in school very close here, and we drove around, we saw a Methodist church. We said, wow. Look at this. <laughs> we are already at home. This Sunday, we are going to worship here. And here we are today. Praise be to God. I will um, hand the microphone over to my wife, who will give us um, a brief prayer to start the worship. Oh, Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to teach you something before I pray. Uh, back in Africa, when you say praise the Lord, the congregation says hallelujah. Can we try that? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise our Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Let us pray. We thank you for bringing us into this family. We thank you for a time like this when brothers, sisters, families come to you. And we pray, Father, that for as long as we are under you, and you will continue to protect and guide us. We pray for this service today, that you are going to use our pastor to talk to us, that we will be seeing the pastor, but we will be feeling your presence. We pray that you come into this holy gathering and give us all our heart's desire and meet each and every one of us at the point of our need. And that at the end of this get together, at the end of this service, we will continue to praise your name, knowing that you are the Alpha and Omega. We thank you for everything you've done to us, for journey messages, for families, for friends. And we say, Father, may all glory, honor, adoration be unto your name 
For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I promise that if your daughter, the dentist, comes and worships here, we will not do that same thing to her, okay? <laughs> Put her on the spot. All right. And here in just a moment, you'll have an opportunity to give your gifts. Um, if you're here in the sanctuary, we have offering plates by the exit doors here. Um, you know, just this week and the staff, we were talking about um, how the youth in Sunday school that Sunday had been teasing each other back and forth and how much fun they were having doing that. And it just reminded me that uh, you and I might not be in the room for that kind of thing. Uh, but whenever we give here at Asbury, um, we are just as much a part of that ministry and every other ministry that God is doing through our church. And so we're really grateful for all those who give. At this time, I want to invite the kids who want to go to WOW Worship to join Miss J. Lynn in the back here. And um, y'all can go on to WOW. And I will say a quick prayer over our offering. And then you'll have an opportunity uh, to give your gifts. And then we'll join together in singing. Um, let's pray together once again. Father God, we thank you so much for bringing us to this space this morning, for reminding us that this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, that it is not our day today, it is your day. And we want everything about the way we spend our time, the way that we speak, the way that we look at and treat one another to reflect that we know that this is not ours, but yours. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the gifts that are given here today and use them according to your kingdom purposes. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the ways that hopefully we feel your presence among us here this morning. We pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, would be found to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, I'll go ahead and take a seat. We began a new series last week where we are learning about the 21 questions that John Wesley, uh, who started the Methodist Church that um, our friend's church is named after, uh, that he would ask himself every day and that he would ask his small group um, to kind of get in touch with where they were with the Lord spiritually at that time. Uh, last week, we handed out this handout. It has all 21 questions listed. If you don't have one yet, then you can grab one from an usher on your way out the door today. And uh, I encourage you to do so. And, uh, you know, folks are just keeping it in their Bibles. You might have brought one from home today with you. You can pull it out at this time if you want to or put it on your fridge or however so that you have these questions available to you. And our encouragement to you is every day just choose one question, whatever the next question is, and kind of focus on that in your devotional time this week. Last week we asked the kind of question that you would expect from a, a churchy kind of question. We were asking about do you enjoy prayer? Not do you pray, but do you enjoy prayer? That's the kind of thing you would expect a pastor to ask, right? Or that you would a expect Wesley to put on a list of questions. Today, we're going to look at a few questions that you might not think of quite so often when it comes to your spiritual life. Questions like this one, do I go to bed on time and get up on time? <laughs> That's actually a spiritual question. Did you know that? You know why? Because if you don't go to bed on time, then when you do go to bed or when you get up, you're less likely to have the energy that you need to pray and spend time connecting with God. Same if you don't wake up on time. Uh, this is hypothetical and never happens to me personally. But you might find yourself rushing in the morning, you know, and you have no time to spend with the Lord before you get your day going. Humans are by nature, mind, body, and spirit. And if any one of those is out of whack, it has kind of a cascading effect on all of the others. So not going to bed on time or getting up on time is a spiritual issue, just like everything else is in life, honestly. Or how about this one? Do I grumble or complain constantly? Whew, that's fun, huh? And you know why these questions are valuable questions? Because it is a freaking shame when somebody spends a decade or three in a pew, and you can't tell a lick of difference by the way that they live their life. They're no more generous. They're no more hopeful. They're no more compassionate than they were when they got started. If our lives have not been made visibly different by our faith, then it's probably because we've been trying to avoid questions like these. We've refused to let the mind-level belief in God sink down into our attitudes, our hearts, change the way we actually live. And if we grumble or complain constantly, that's a sign, it's a signal that we probably are struggling to rest in thankfulness to the Lord, okay? So it's not about you should just feel really bad and guilty about the, if you complain. It's more about the fact that you might, it's a sign you might be struggling to rest in thankfulness. We are probably, it, we all struggle with being God-centered rather than self-centered. And if we, all we have to contribute to the world is negativity about our own lives and problems, that's a sign that maybe there's a spiritual issue going on, okay? Here's another fun one on the list. Am I proud? Oh my goodness, there is nothing as unbecoming to me and a Christian as pride. And you know, I, I want to be real clear about this, because sometimes churches go too far on the other end. There is a fine line between being happy with who God made you to be and being able to be honest about the gifts that he's given us and celebrating that, and on the other hand, acting like we're the ones who made the sunshine, okay? It's true, you are incredible, and you are lovely and talented and capable, and you should be able to acknowledge that and for it to make you feel good. Being, ha like being happy with who God made you to be is a good thing. It's just that you're not any of those things on your own, 
right? You had nothing to do with how much smarts you were born with or how much common sense you were born with or not in some of our cases. It's all grace. It's all gift, okay? So be confident and be happy and be content with yourself, but not out of pride for what you've done. Instead, out of gratitude for what God has made possible. Do you hear the difference there? Yeah, it just feels a little different. And that gets us to the question that we're going to focus on today, the last of this week's bunch. And since they've all been easy, uh, this one is going to be too. <laughs> Are you ready? It's a doozy. Am I defeated in any part of my life? Okay, am I defeated in any part of my life? And this is tricky because so often defeat is a matter of perspective, you know? And what's the purpose of this question anyway? Just to make people feel bad? Like if you feel defeated, you're a messed up as a Christian or something? No, I don't think it's that. But there is a lot for us to unpack here. So first, I want you to imagine that you're standing at the edge of a river, and you need to cross the river, okay? And you're looking across, trying to figure out how you're going to do it, and you see a nice big rock right in the middle of the river, and you're like, great, this is perfect. I can use that to kind of get across, but there's a problem. The rock is too far away from where you are on the shore, and there's no little rocks in between. You can't figure out how to get to that rock, so you feel defeated. But are you defeated, actually? Maybe not, because in, in this case, there's another way. The river is so shallow, you can actually just walk across the river, and the water won't even get up to your knees. It's kind of like when you're on the Guadalupe, and you're having to scooch your booty on the tube, you know, because it's so shallow. I mean, maybe. Anyway, uh, we feel defeated sometimes, when in reality, it's just that we've hit an obstacle, right? And if we would only persevere through the obstacle and kind of problem solve it, we could reach our goal. Sometimes we feel defeated, but we're not actually. And then sometimes we're on the verge of victory. We're so close, but we start feeling defeated and we almost give up. Not because we are in danger of being defeated, really, but just because we're tired. We're tired. I think of Moses do you remember the story of him standing on the edge of the battlefield? And as long as he was keeping his arms up, the Israelites were winning the battle. But as soon as he lowered his hands, they started to lose on the ground. And his arms are getting tired, and he's not sure that he can keep them up any longer. And he's afraid that they're going to be defeated when they're on the verge of victory because he is the one losing Steam. Have you ever felt like that, that it's all on your shoulders and that you are almost there, but you're not sure you can have the last little oomph to make it to the finish line? Which, by the way, is when we need to do like Moses and find some friends who will hold our arms up for us until it's all over. Anyway, in cases like this, we're not actually defeated. We just feel like we are. And we just need a little help persevering through the obstacle. So part of what we need is discernment from the Lord to know when we're in a case of true defeat or if we're just feeling defeated. But then there are times when we really are defeated, friends. If this is the river in front of me, <laughs> right? and it's all white water, and it's covered in rapids all the way across, and it's super deep, I am not going to win this one, okay? Sometimes the challenge in front of us is insurmountable. There's nothing you can do about it. You lose one at work sometimes, or you can really hope for something in your family, and it just doesn't come to be. Admitting defeat where there really has been a defeat, that's not ungodly. You're not like giving up on the Lord or anything. It's not for lack of trying or for lack of praying hard enough. Sometimes things just aren't possible, right? Sometimes they just fail, and we sometimes get defeated. And the more interesting question from a spiritual perspective isn't whether or not we ever get defeated. It's about what we do after. So today, I want us to spend a minute looking at the most important defeat of all time. It happens to be located in your Bibles. And we're going to turn together to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. There should be a blue Bible in the chair in front of you. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. 
You're still going to have to go about three quarters of the way to find it, though. We're going to be in Matthew 27, beginning in verse 27. Here we go. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's house, and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. That's about 600, by the way. They stripped him, put a red military coat on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a stick in his right hand. Then they bowed down in front of him and mocked him, saying, Hey, king of the Jews. After they spit on him, they took the stick and struck his head again and again. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the military coat and put his own clothes back on him. They led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they found Simon, a man from Cyrene. They forced him to carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means skull place, the, the hillside looks like the shape of a skull. They gave Jesus wine mixed with vinegar to drink. But after tasting it, he didn't drink it. It's no wonder. After they crucified him, they divided up his clothes among them by drawing lots. They sat there guarding him. They placed above his head the charge against him and said, Here's Jesus, the king of the Jews. They crucified him with two outlaws, one on his right side and one on his left. Those who were walking by insulted Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, So you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, weren't you? Go ahead and save yourself. If you're God's son, come on down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the legal experts and the elders, everybody important in Jerusalem, were making fun of him, saying he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's a king of Israel, isn't he? So let him come down from the cross now, then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, so let God deliver him now if he wants to. He said, I'm God's son. And in Matthew's gospel, the outlaws who were crucified with him insulted him in the same way. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At about three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing there said, he's calling Elijah. One of them ran over with a sponge full of vinegar ugh, and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest of them said, let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And again, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, and then he died. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I know that it probably sounds sacrilegious to suggest that Jesus' crucifixion was a defeat. It feels weird, doesn't it? And John's gospel, he doesn't really read it that way as a defeat. But here in Matthew, a man gets arrested, stripped, mocked, spit on, hit on the head with a stick, insulted, has people gambling on his stolen clothes, and he gets nailed to a cross. There really is no way to read that without reading it as a defeat, friends. Someone makes one uncharitable comment to me, and I feel defeated all day long. All that can happen in my day is that I forget a kid's lunchbox at school or I have 500 unmatched socks and I can't find one dadgum pair and I feel defeated, okay? Jesus, meanwhile, has all these truly horrific things happen to him that leads to his actual death. And if you had a friend who was innocent but on death row and you made an appeal and it doesn't work and they die, that's a defeat, Okay? There's no way around it. And not only is the crucifixion a defeat, but I believe Jesus indicated he felt defeated when he was on the cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you left me? Does God ever leave us? No, but are there times when it feels like it? Of course, yes. He feels alone, defeated, weak, beat, done. And we don't like to think about it that way because we know that Easter is coming. Praise God. But that's the whole point, friends. Crucifixion is defeat, and resurrection is victory. Christianity doesn't keep us from ever experiencing defeat. Jesus didn't just get around that part, right? 
But our relationship with Jesus does keep us from being ultimately defeated because the story doesn't end there. Do you hear the difference there? Let me say it in a different way. I don't, I don't know that she was talking about Jesus when she said this, but I want to see if you hear it the way I heard it. A woman named Mary Pickford once said, failure is not the falling down, but it's the staying down. Failure is not the falling down, but it's the staying down. And Jesus fell down. <laughs> He was taken off the cross, laying on the ground, buried in a tomb, but he did not stay down. Amen? Amen. And that is true for us, too. We all fall. We all fail. But there's a difference between experiencing defeat and being defeated. And experiencing defeat isn't even that bad. Could the resurrection have happened if Jesus didn't die first? No, of course not. Did you know that Abraham Lincoln failed in business, he failed in politics, and he had a nervous breakdown before becoming the best president we've ever had? Did you know that Marie Curie was rejected from the prestigious French Academy of Sciences before she became the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize? Did you know that Tom Watson, the founder of IBM, once said, if you want to succeed, double your failure rate? Because oftentimes the learning, the journey that includes a defeat leads us directly to our greatest success. It sure did for Jesus. You only get the empty tomb by way of the cross. But as I was preparing this message today, I was kind of struggling over it. And I texted some pastor friends of mine. I was like, guys, do you really think it's okay to suggest that God experienced defeat? Because it just feels wrong. You know, I think we need to normalize this, though. I think we need to start getting honest and authentic about this, because in reality, God's will does get defeated all the time. Does God want us to sin? No. Do people still sin? Yes. So in that moment, our will defeats God's will. You feel that, right? Anytime a young child dies, God's will does not win out. Anytime, anyway, there's all kinds of times, right, when God's will gets defeated. And we have to be willing to say that. And it doesn't make God fragile to admit it. Because if we can't say that, then what that means is that every single thing that happens has to be God's will. And that turns God into a monster. Okay? And we know that all of the horrible things that happen on earth are not God's fault. So we have to be able to say that sometimes God's will isn't the thing that happens. It's not. Sometimes God's will gets defeated. And maybe if we can start being honest about that, about God, and get and stop misrepresenting him and his heart in the world, if we can admit that the cross was a defeat, but that the empty tomb was the victory, then maybe we can begin to to admit that we get defeated sometimes, and it's okay. So back to Wesley's question, am I defeated in any part of my life? And what I want to suggest to you today is that when we are in Christ, we may have experienced defeat, but we are not defeated. In fact, can you say that along with me this morning? I have experienced defeat, but I am not defeated. Because the story did not end on Good Friday. And Though we might have moments of defeat in our lives, that's not the same as living as a defeated person. Now, I don't think Wesley intended this question to come off as judgy as it sounds at first. But I think what he realized was that you don't want to allow a momentary defeat to evolve into a defeated attitude. Because then we do have a spiritual issue. It is dangerous to allow defeat to defeat us. Do you know why? Because when we have done that in that moment, probably without realizing it, not even on purpose, but in our mind, here's what we've said. Nope, God can't have the victory here. There's no hope. We've conceded, not on behalf of ourselves, but on behalf of God. God could handle defeating Satan God could even have victory over death by providing eternal life, bringing Jesus back from the dead. That wasn't too hard for God. But this problem that I'm having, 
this grief that I'm living through, this lack of purpose that I'm feeling in this stage of my life, I finally found the defeat that God can't have victory over? You see the problem with that mindset? You very well may have experienced complete defeat. That doesn't necessarily mean a dadgum thing in terms of your spiritual life. Your defeat did not come because you didn't pray enough, okay? Depending on the circumstance, you might have had a hand in it or you might not have. But just because you experienced defeat doesn't necessarily mean that you did anything wrong as a Christian or anything wrong at all. Sometimes it just happens. The question is, are you going to let that defeat defeat you? Or are you going to hand it over to God and ask him to redeem it with his resurrection power? Are you going to cling to the hope that God will have the ultimate victory, just like he always has? Are you going to hold fast to the promise that God gave us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. The way that God redeems it might look different than you hoped. It might not receive the thing you were originally looking for. But in Christ, it never, never, never ends in defeat. So here's how we keep from being defeated, having a defeated attitude in our lives when we experience defeat. I got clued into this by Pastor Steve Windy, uh, who used to pastor First Methodist in downtown Houston. He said, the first thing you got to do is you got to look around. Because when you're, you're feeling defeated, you feel like you're the only one in that moment. You feel like you've got nobody else who understands, right? So look around. There once was a kid who dreamed of playing football. He had to talk his way onto his college team. He was the seventh string on that team, okay? His junior year, he made it to a starting position, but he had to trade off quarters with another player because the coaches were unconvinced of his skill. Senior year, he finally made it to be a starter. Uh, he put his name in for the NFL draft, and he was selected all the way up number 199, <laughs> okay? In the sixth round, he was the fourth string on his NF NFL team. They needed him just in case number one, two, and three all got injured on the same day, of course. And imagine how many times this guy had to feel discouraged along the way and feel defeated all along the journey, right? Anybody know who I'm talking about? Now he's won seven Super Bowls, <laughs> right? The first thing you do when you're feeling defeated is look around and realize that everybody else has felt defeated before too, <laughs> okay? You are not the only one. Tell somebody about it. Ask them about their experience. Remember that you are not alone in it, okay? The first thing you do is you look around. The second step is you look directly at it. Just like we did, we looked at the cross this morning. We looked at it square in the face. You call it what it is. But instead of seeing it just as a failure, a black spot on your life, dig in and see what you can learn from it what it's taught you, what the gift is of that failure and defeat, the grace that is present in it. Because the cross was the location of God's greatest gift of grace ever given for you and for everyone. Every defeat has some gift to offer. Look at it head on. Find the gift. Okay? So step one is look around. Step two is look at it. And finally, what do you think step three is? Look. Look up. Right? Psalm, verse 30, psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. You might want to check out this psalm in your devotional time this week. Here's what it says. A person's steps are made secure by the Lord when they delight in his way. Though they trip up, they won't be thrown down because the Lord holds their hand. Isn't it interesting that the psalm says, if they trip? Wait a second. Is that what it said? No. It says, though they trip up. In other words, 
God knows that we all will trip up from time to time. Though they trip up, they will not be thrown down because the Lord holds their hand. God knows that we're all going to trip up. God knows that we're going to get defeated from time to time. But when we trip, hold on tight to the Lord who is already holding your hand. And he will make your steps secure even when you're feeling wobbly on your feet. So look around, look at it, and look up. We all experience defeat, even the Lord Jesus Christ did. But that doesn't mean that we walk through life a defeated person. Am I defeated in any part of my life? If the answer is no, then praise God, hallelujah, this message wasn't for your today self, it was for your future self, okay? But if the answer is yes, then own it. Bring it to the Lord and ask him to help you. Look around, look at it, and look up until that day when God has the victory over your defeat. Because he always, 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 always does. And he will. Let's pray together. God, thank you. First of all, we just got to thank you for going to the cross. <laughs> we got to thank you that when you're in the Garden of Gethsemane and you could have run back to Bethany, you didn't. You stayed. You were committed to letting us see just how deep your love for us goes. Thank you for providing us salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you that we have Good Friday, but even more so, thank you that we have Resurrection Sunday. Thank you that that isn't just some story from 2,000 years ago, but that it's actually the story of our lives, that we experience defeat sometimes, that we feel weak, but your power is made perfect in our weakness, and that you always have the victory whenever we delight in the Lord and walk according to your way, and we stay trusting and faithful to you, Lord. So this morning we pray that if there's any place in which we are feeling defeated, that you would give us the courage and the strength to take that defeat in our hands and lift it up to the throne and steward that defeat well and say, Lord, even this is yours. I pray that you use it for your kingdom purpose. I believe that you will have victory over this. Keep me by your side. Keep me trusting you until I see the victory. Because we know, Lord, that the victory is always yours. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. At this time, we have a chance to lift our voices together in song. I encourage you, if you're uh, here and able, stand with us. We're going to sing one more time together. This is called Sea of Victory, and it is a um, that we're going to claim um, the words that Pastor Lindsay just preached, that Jesus has the final victory over our lives. Let's sing together. <laughs>
Wonderful. We all take a seat for just a second. And at this time, I'm going to ask the Sanders family to come forward. Um, Ken and Kenna have been worshiping with us for several weeks now with their daughter, Janie. Janie is going to be in our, pre, in our day school this year. And, and so that's how they found our church. And we are so excited to have you join. I'm so excited. Do you know who your teacher is? Okay. <laughs> Miss Salem. My daughter is going to be in the same class with you. How exciting is that? Yay. Okay. So um, we are so excited to have them join with us. And uh, they, they live nearby. They're already getting very plugged in and um, connected here at our church. And we are thrilled to have you. I'm going to, we got to talk together uh, last week about what it means to join the church here. And so I'm going to ask a question that won't come as any surprise to you at all. And it is this. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and put all your trust in his grace and promise to serve him through this congregation in the United Methodist Church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. And congregation, we're going to make a commitment back to them. Will you join with me? We will support them as a part of our body of Christ. We will pray for them, encourage their faith, and walk alongside them as brothers and sisters in Christ. We will continue to seek opportunities to worship regularly, grow in our faith, serve together, and share the good news of Jesus Christ, making disciples in his name. Will you welcome them with me this morning? This is your note from your shepherd. Their shepherd is um, Susie. Lyman, and she is out of town today, um, but she had a note for them to welcome them as well. I have a couple of things I want to let you know about. We do have a blood drive going on today until 3 o'clock in our Cornerstone building. We have a couple of spots left open, so if you would like to fill one of those spots, give the gift of life, we encourage you to drop by the other building and take a look at the schedule and, and go ahead and uh, fill one of those spots. Our pumpkin patch is going to be here before you know it. What you might not know is that it's a huge missions fundraiser for us every year. And so net in a few weeks, September 18th, right after this service, we're going to have a pumpkin patch planning meeting. You are not committing yourself to having any shifts in the patch. You're Thank you. Okay, so the 18th is when you're going to be out there. You, what you are signing up for is to help us decorate that day, okay? But no shifts. Um, and then uh, the pumpkins will be arriving the next weekend. And so if you would be willing to do that, you can grab your camera on your phone and just like snap that QR code and sign up and let us know that you'll be able to help us decorate that day. There's also a sign-up sheet on the table as you walk out the doors this morning. We have a couple of more day school teachers who don't have a prayer partner yet. And so if you would be willing, all we're asking you to do is to take the name of that teacher and commit to praying for them during this school year. Send them a Christmas card. Send them a birthday card. That's it. If you'd be willing to do that, you see Jane Lynn standing right over here. And uh, let her know, and she will uh, match you with a teacher, and uh, you'll be able to go from there. And we only have two more Sundays where um, you can uh, participate in our brick sale. If you would like to have um, a brick made in memory or honor of someone and placed in our prayer garden, uh, you can go to the table here. Or if you're worshiping online, you can go to your weekly church email and see the sign up for that as well. We have prayer partners. They would love to pray for you. They'll be up here as the service closes. And the Sanders family will be joining me um, right outside the sanctuary doors, so you'll have an opportunity to greet them. All right, will you please stand and receive the benediction? My hope for you today is that you have been encouraged in the faith and that you know that no matter what the week ahead brings, that the Lord will have the ultimate victory. So go knowing that God goes before you to show you the way, behind you to keep you moving, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you always to give you peace. Amen.